the gospel today is so uh, disturbing. Um, <laughs> you know, for those of you who who heard it, um, and for those of you who grew up hearing this um, gospel, and it always comes toward the end of the liturgical year. It comes at the end of, of, of Pentecost, um, which remember, let's take a step back. Pentecost is this long season and it's green, right? So we wear green in church, um, but it begins on Pentecost Sunday. And um, you don't have to raise your hands, um, but if we were in Sunday school, I'd have a bowl of candy and be throwing out candy for right answers here. Um, but then again, I keep, I keep forgetting the Episcopal church, it probably needs to be sugar-free, vegan, um, we're a very high maintenance food group people. So um, peanut, no peanuts, not in the same zip code. No, no. Um, so uh, you'll just have to, I'll, I'll be throwing love to those of you getting things, uh, getting things right. But in the, uh, in the Episcopal church, we have green for this whole season, but our Orthodox brothers and sisters, um, actually their Pentecost Sunday, see we have red, remember? Um, and the reading is about the tongues of fire, which is why the stoles are red and the chasuble is red. And um, depending on how much your church um, gets all decked out, it's just it's just red. And the idea is we are celebrating this fire coming. Um, uh, the, when the Holy Spirit says it's time to be the church, Jesus did his thing, the baton has been passed, and it's just an explosion of fire. But then the very next morning on Monday, if you go to morning prayer, we're in green. So it's interesting, the season begins in red, but the season of Pentecost, which goes all the way now until next Sunday, Christ the King, which finishes up our liturgical year, and then boom, we say goodbye. I love that. For those of you who are so sick of 2020, you want this year to end? Well, you're a Christian, people, in two weeks, <laughs> over. You don't have to wait till New Year's Day. We kiss it goodbye for Advent one. So I'm actually very excited to say goodbye 2020. So goodbye, that's what we do in two weeks. But think of this, we've been at Pentecost season since last spring. But here's what I love. And this is very much about evangelism. The, the Orthodox church, do you know what their, their color for Pentecost is green? Because remember in the creed, the, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. So the idea is that it's the Holy Spirit that is the kind of manifestation of God into creation, into new life. So if you, I don't know if any of you have ever been in Orthodox Church on Pentecost Sunday, they bring in trees and plants and vines. They hang them from the ceilings. I mean, poor churches all across the Orthodox world, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Poland, and churches, people bring plants from home. They turn their church into like the sixth day of creation. And when they say healing prayers throughout the year, they light green candles. So they take this green that we're in right now, that this is the season of health and God doing um, what the Bible says, a new thing. So they don't understand why the, the Western church, why we do red for Sunday. I mean, they get the tongues of fire, but they believe the real point of Pentecost is what comes into the world at Pentecost is life. So yes, it comes in fire, but don't get caught up on the fire like it's a, a flash in the pan. And that's what happens sometimes. We have a flash in the pan on Pentecost. Some churches have all kinds of, you know, people have the streamers. You ever seen how some churches do liturgical dance and, and they get the red all over the place. And I always get the streamers all kind of caught in my head and stuff like that. And then a lot of churches just stop talking about it and they call green ordinary time. That's what Pentecost is. Or the Orthodox think we are crazy talking like this. They said Pentecost is weeks and weeks and weeks right now of a meditation on life and new life, on healing. I kind of love how much of Pentecost happened in COVID. We have a liturgical season for praying for health, praying for life, new life, plants, ferns, weeds, invasive species, whatever it is that you think about. When you think about life, just mustard. You ever plant a mustard seed? You'll have mustard in that place for a generation. You can't stop it from growing. That's why Jesus uses that as an example. Mustard is one seed and your whole yard can be taken over in a year. So that's the season we're in right now. This unbelievable season of life, new life. In fact, the church that I serve at, at St. Clement, we, well, we made some Advent things for people to take home. And this year we're, we're putting a green candle 
in there and a little prayer to the Holy Spirit. Um, as a mark to people that even as we enter the new year of the church to remember this tradition that the Holy Spirit is the giver of life. So pray for people with COVID, pray for people afraid of getting COVID, pray for people for whom COVID is destroying the rest of their lives economically, um, communally, the loneliness, the loneliness. I'm looking at the screen right now and I actually see I am related to someone on this screen. Good morning, mom. Um, the nice thing about my mom, she's in Goodwin House, which is, you know, a mile or two out my window. We've seen each other maybe half a dozen times in a year, right? That's crazy. That And the kind of loneliness that I feel to be so close to my mom and yet not really, almost like she's behind glass. This is craziness. So the Orthodox would say, light the green candle, pray for the Lord, the giver of life. God is always doing a new thing always doing a new thing, even in death. Remember the church thrived under the emperor Nero. We can do this people. I don't care who the president is. If the church can grow under Nero, where he's put lions after us, we can do this. But we can't do it by thinking there's something called ordinary time that right now we're kind of just waiting for Advent to start. And now we come to the gospel today. And what does this have to do with that evangelism? Here it is. It's a scary gospel because it sounds like a guy got punished for just trying to save his money. I've actually never really known what to say about this gospel, right? There's a nice guy who was, he was given like money and thought, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. So I'm just going to bury it. And the master, I can't get in trouble, right? Because gosh, I, I didn't lose the money. And then the master comes and says, what do you mean you just buried it in the ground? And the guy said, well, you're kind of a jerk. So I was a little afraid. So here's your money back. And, and then the story has this message that he was the one that did something wrong. But here's the thing, that's, he's a, the guy did something wrong if the point, he said he thought the point was not losing the money. The point was to share and have joy. So by saving the money, he lost the joy of trying things and failing and experimenting. Um, so today is actually weird that I'm here talking about evangelism because our gospel is very much about evangelism. Not that if you don't share your faith, you're going to be thrown into the fires of hell or whatever. That's not the point. The point is we're invited to share, not because God needs us to share, but because our lives are flooded with meaning when you share. Just, just yesterday, there's a, there's a little boy on our campus um, who's the son of a seminarian and he's 12. He just got diagnosed with type one diabetes, which is pretty horrible um, to be 12. And he just got home from the hospital yesterday and he's a big Harry Potter fan. Um, so I went down to my basement and I gathered up all these Harry Potter gifts and things I've been given over the years and made a whole packet for, and left it over there. Um, and I didn't buy any of this stuff. This is just Harry Potter stuff. I'm a big Harry Potter fan. And my, my basement is actually full of things people have given me. Um, so everything was new. So I just wrapped it all up. And if you know anything about Harry Potter, I um, in Harry Potter, all the mail is delivered by owls. So I wrapped up a package for him and I glued all these feathers all over it. So it looked like an owl had delivered it. And I went and left it on his porch at, on the seminary with his name on it. Um, and it was his package. And I, and I put the, re the return address from England, which is where the, the school is in the story. And his dad came over an hour later to my doorstep weeping. His father was weeping, but I think it's, you know, he just found out his son has diabetes, but he's weeping to thank me and we can't touch each other. So he's on my lawn with a mask. I'm at my door with a mask. He's weeping about this gift. And I'm thinking that gift didn't cost me anything. So I'm, I'm yelling at him across the lawn. It was all in my basement. Like I didn't spend any money at all. I'm just sorry that, that you have um, a horrible diagnosis. There's no playing around with that. We manage diabetes well, but this is a horrible diagnosis for them and as a family. Um, and they, they don't have any money and they've committed their lives to Navajo land for the rest of their lives. So they're here for education and then they're gonna go back and minister in Navajo land. Um, so of course I gave them all my Harry Potter stuff in the basement. But I tell you this story because to have a talent in, in my basement where it's safe, if I had said, well, I don't wanna give away my Harry Potter stuff because maybe I'll need it tomorrow or maybe someone else will need it or maybe I'll have to go to a grab bag party and I wanna save some, I didn't. I went down to that basement and I pulled out every single puppet, pair of socks, 
a Harry Potter um, hairbrush. I'm like putting it in a bag. Um, and I hadn't even seen the gospel for, for today, but this is a perfect example. Just give it away. And then what happens is I'm blessed. I went to bed last night and thought I had no idea a bunch of trinkets you know, that you get on mail order in my basement made a man cry. And the reason he came alone is his son was crying and at 12, he was embarrassed to come and cry. So to move someone like that, to me is evangelism. And it's not that I gave them something that they needed. It's that I have things from God and, and giving it gave me the best day ever. I even woke up this morning thinking about this boy and his father and, and the puppets, and I don't want them in my basement. Yesterday, those things were dusty in my basement. This morning, I bet he's running around. I gave him a tie and a, a, a robe, which is part of the costume. I can picture this 12-year-old probably just took his first insulin shots this morning. But he's running around his house with a puppet and a robe and a wand. And I'm sitting to myself, then I heard the gospel this morning. I was like, this is why this gospel is perfect. Chrissy Crosby, you're brilliant for wanting to talk about evangelism. As we finish up this season of life and healing, and you want to you wanna wrap up your, your community's conversation about being a beloved community, and a lot of people would say, well, why do you want to talk about evangelism at the end of meditating on beloved community? Because... To be a beloved community is a lot of work, listening to each other, praying, reading books about race, thinking about money. And, and Satan gets into your head and says, Christianity is a lot of work, isn't it? So you might have one or two reactions. You're so proud of yourself for all the hard work you're doing at church. You're gonna fork over a hundred bucks for a Thanksgiving basket. And somewhere in your, in your mind, you're gonna say, because I'm like that. I'll mention that to a few other people, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm generous like that. So Satan loves when we turn Christianity into work, because then that immediately gives us pride. We're so good at this. Or Satan gets in your head and says, you're not good at this at all. You know, it's not enough. So what, you make one Thanksgiving basket, you know how many hungry people there are in Alexandria? That does nothing. So Satan loves when Christianity's work because no matter how we think about it, if we think about it as work, we're never gonna feel good about it because we're either doing too much or not enough or we're superheroes or we're a jerk. But evangelism says this, Christianity is not work. It's not. It is a relationship with God where the goal is for us to share God's joy. That's the whole thing. And you all know this. I mean, why are you not baptized and then like Star Trek, like beamed up? You ever wondered that? Like, why is it that when we get baptized, we don't just enter the Trinity? Gone. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Baptized, get wet. And it's like a slip and slide right through the font into heaven. And a couple of nice Christians volunteer to stay here and keep dropping everybody in. But basically the point would be you enter the Trinity from the beginning. Why are we here especially when there's so much suffering. We have salvation. That's what baptism is about. And if, by the way, if anyone asks you why get baptized, please don't be trying to be nice to everybody and say, well, it's a ritual. You receive salvation in the font. Okay, that's what's going on there. Every now and then I visit a church. I'm like, where's your font? They're like, oh, it's down. I visited a church and they said, it's down the hall. It's on display. We took it out of the sanctuary. It's down. I walked down the hallway and then there was this like, there was like lights and fake plants. It looked like some kind of weird museum. They said, isn't it beautiful? We put it on display. I was like, Satan loves where you've put this. You've taken it out of worship, out of the sanctuary. It looks like it's dead. It does. It looks like a, like a, like a, what do you call those? Like that, you know, the museum where they have all the carved uh, wax museum. That's what it looked like. It looked like a wax font. I was like, please, please, screw tape. There are whole screw tape letters about what you've done here. Please put this back in the sanctuary. Be and they were like, well, you know, we don't want to make it look like you have to join the church. You know, that makes people feel uncomfortable. I said, please put it at the entrance to the door, please, for the love of God, and send the message that we're not just a group of people. This isn't just the United Way with vestments. Okay, we're not some community service organization here that just dresses well. 
there is a font that is a portal into the Trinity. That's what's going on here. And anything you need to know to make that choice, we're here to teach. So we're either going to teach you up to the fact that you want to dive in, or we're going to embrace you when you come out wet. And the whole purpose of this building is that every person, every pet, everything goes through this font. Because there's only one way into the Trinity, baptism. Again, I say this because we're talking about evangelism. I, I, I'm intentionally having you say like, oh, what? is she saying Jesus is the only way? Of course, Jesus is the only way. What are we doing saying anything else? There's not some parallel universe. God has given us a way into the Trinity. Now you may say, but what about my Jewish brother-in-law? Are you being a jerk about him? No, I have no idea how your Jewish brother-in-law is interacting with Jesus. He's probably talking to him more than I am. He may not use the name because I get in traffic on 495 and I can drive like a bit of a jerk. So if he doesn't do that, he's closer to the Lord than I am. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. So I'm not worried about the Muslim. I'm not worried about the Jewish guy because I understand how this works. Everything that will live forever will be embraced by God through Christ, period. And if that's not your thing, that's fine. I'm not saying leave the church, but I'm sure you must hate the prayer book. I mean, if you think there's other ways to know God besides Jesus, you must not like our hymnal. And the catechism must really kind of raise your temperature. I mean, everything that we pray in this tradition says God has given us a way, a road, uh, a wardrobe into Narnia. That's what the wardrobe is, by the way, that's the font. And that's why you can get into Narnia from many different places, right? So we have, you can be baptized here, you can be baptized there. Other people in the depth of a different religious tradition, God can enter and break through and take that soul into the Trinity forever. That's why I love being an Anglican. We believe God reaches and pulls anyone into the font, but that's what happens. And our evangelism is very awkward and weird when we're just really afraid that what we're saying is gonna hurt the feelings of our Confucian hairdresser. We don't wanna hurt their feelings. So we just kind of say Christianity is like, we're trying to be nice. Um, we wonder why people don't come to our churches because when they come, we just make sure that they know they don't have to come. So that is a very sort of long meditation on the fact that in this season of the year, we get this gospel that wants us very clear that although we've been thinking about the life that comes from the Holy Spirit, we get reminded the, sun, the second Sunday before the new year begins. Remember, you're not given a talent to save it. Because that makes you the savior. Is that really your job? No. The savior has saved the money, right? We are the money. Jesus has already saved us. Our job is to share the joy. Go to bed at night and say, this is what it feels like to give, to see that God has a mission and I want to join it. So how actually, um, I'd love to ask a question or two of you, but let me phrase it like this. If you read some Rowan Williams, um, I don't know in your congregation if you've ever, have you ever done like a, um, um, read his uh, Being Christian or does anyone want to just weigh in for a second if there's ever been any kind of church engagement with Rowan Williams? Don't worry if there isn't. I'm just, I, I want to make sure I don't repeat myself. Anybody want to weigh in on that? Anything on Rowan Williams? Unmute yourself and scream. Okay, no shame, no shame. This is great. This is like saying you haven't had cookie dough ice cream yet. There's no shame in that, but there's definitely a project. Think with me for a second, because I'm going to ask you a question about it. Rowan Williams, who comes to America about once a year, and he comes to a church, Church of the Epiphany, um, where I was raised up as a priest and, and have gone for, for years. And he has a phrase that I'm not a tattoo person. My mom is on the call. Mom, don't worry. I don't have a tattoo. I'm not getting a tattoo no worries, mom. Um, my dad was a Marine. He had a lot of tattoos, but don't worry. I'm not going to do that. Um, but if I did ever get a tattoo that said something, which I'm not going to do, mom, um, it would be this phrase from Ron Williams. He was asked last time he was here about two years ago, what is the purpose of the church? Now, a person or a family or a parish that understands evangelism 
again, evangelism isn't saving anybody. Don't flatter yourself. You're not Jesus. That, and by the way, that's exhausting. Evangelism isn't sharing how to be a good person according to Christianity. Most of us are jerks a lot of the time. So if Christianity is a moral enterprise, a lot of us are failing. So that obviously isn't the call to love. But the, the, the people that understand evangelism are ones who I think embrace Rowan's definition of what is the purpose of the church? He said in one sentence, uh, and by the way, this guy with the eyebrows and the hair, I mean, he just looks like this, like a Greek God or something, but he opens his mouth and he said this, the purpose of the church is to form people into the kinds of people who can receive the gifts that God wants to give. Now I'm offering this phrase to you both to end your reflect, to close your reflection on being a beloved community and to think about evangelism. I think the best way to do that, we could even stop the call now, is to hand you this definition of what it means to be the church. Because I think it can focus the things that you thought about being a beloved community and it can focus to think about how to be that community in a world that is not that community. That's another way of saying evangelism, that we've been, we who have a rhythm of baptism and Eucharist and baptism and Eucharist, which by the way, goes on forever. The book of Revelation is all about that. It's great church forever. So we believe that that's what's happening. But how do we, God also hasn't beamed us up like Star Trek. We're here. So how do we have this rhythm of, of font and altar and font and altar. And how do we kind of invite the whole world into it while we're still here? Jesus could come back before the end of this conversation and then don't worry about it. But if he it does not come back, how do we live in the world? So Rowan gives us this definition, which I think does the identity of, of, of being beloved community and the mission of being the church in the world. And I'll repeat it again, it's fascinating. The purpose of the church is to form people into the kinds of people who can receive the gifts that God wants to give. So when I go into a dog park and I fire up a conversation with someone about God, what's my goal? What's my purpose? As an Episcopalian, it is not to save their soul, okay? Unless I wanna to apply to be Jesus. Now, Satan would love if I thought that was my goal, that I could count up the number of people I saved every time I went to a dog park, a little notch on my belt. So Satan would love for you to think you're the savior. So ignore that, spit at Satan. By the way, I went to an Orthodox church once. Do you know once a year, they have a ceremony in Greek Orthodoxy. Are you ready for this? They pull out an icon of Satan, literally. It's terrifying. And everybody lines up like communion and they spit on it. It's literally one of the, my favorite liturgies I've ever seen. And it was, in, it was in Russian and I think I couldn't, like I didn't, I was visiting in Boston literally once a year. The little children, everybody, you pick up your kid and, they, and, they, and there's a wiper, someone is wiping off the icon. Once a year you spit at Satan and you turn your back, you walk away. I love that that was happening in Washington DC. I was amazing. So spit at the idea that you're the savior. You're going to the dog park, you're going to Starbucks, you're going into a community meeting on, or on Zoom. We're not supposed to try to save anybody. I mean, come on, we, we can't, we shouldn't. Satan loves it, spit at that idea. But we wanna form people into the kinds of people who can receive grace. Because as Episcopalians, we trust that if a, if a person is shaped, is open to receive grace, salvation can come to them. Not from us, but what we can help each other do is to shape our lives to be the kinds of lives that can receive. Think of if there's a bunch of mason jars, you go into a room and there's just all these mason jars. I don't know what those were, by the way, some of you can canners. I learned about this recently. But think of all those jars. And you know what the evangelist does? It's not your job to fill the mason jars with um, cherries or pickles. It's your job to open them. Open them. And then walk away. 
and trust that God is like rain on the earth from the beginning of time. It says the Holy Spirit blew over creation. All humans, all that the church, all that the Episcopal church is meant to do is open the jars and then watch as God fills what God will fill. The rain will come, it won't, that's not, that's not for us. We are aqueducts, is what I said recently in, in a Facebook post. The rain is not us, don't get into that. Don't listen to people that tell you that your job is to, to make the water to save the people. You just have to aim your life so that the water that comes to you, the gifts you're receiving from God, go to other people. So that's both a mission for your church um, and it's evangelism. You see how these things start to all of a sudden you realize we don't have to like take on evangelism for two months and think about it and read about it. Um, no, evangelism is simply what the church is doing to be a font and alter metabolism in a world that doesn't have that metabolism. So that's, I mean, evangelism is just kind of what the church is doing. I'm curious if any of you would be willing to respond to that phrase, that the purpose of the church is to form the kind of people who can receive the gifts that God wants to give. Have you heard that before? Uh, does that resonate with you? Um, or can you think of a time where you have actually seen the church do that? Open jars, maybe even in your own life. So that's a, that's a hard question, but um, I've talked a lot and I'd like to, you can just unmute, make sure you unmute yourself. Out, remember? So it's not like God needs a, a workforce, right? So what, what we lose if we don't do something um, is we lose, you don't get to go to bed last night with knowing some kid on campus is crying because he's got a wand he didn't pay for. I feel like a million dollars this morning and I realize I didn't have to buy anything, but I did have to give, right? So, and and I again, I don't use that example to brag. I, I hope every one of you has an example in the last week or month or year, especially under COVID, where you have kind of gone into your basement, so to speak, and taken something that you received and by giving it to someone else, you see what it looks like for God to fill them. Like, by, so it's interesting, right? So when we give something to someone, we're actually opening their jar because they have to receive what you're giving unless they don't take it. And then when you walk away, they have the experience of something coming into their jar. And you know what God does? He wants people to want more of that. But they have to get a set, like one potato chip. Think of yourselves as being the first Pringles potato chip. You take the top off, you pop the lid and you hand one potato chip to someone and then you just leave the can there and you walk away. That's evangelism. They are gonna keep going. Now, a lot of us think it's our job to make the potatoes or to brand the jar or have a theological argument about how many potato chips should be in there. This is where we get lost. Then you say, well, let's have a silent auction to buy more potatoes. Let's do a reading series on Pringles and additives. <sighs> Open the can, give the chip and watch the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit has done from the beginning of time. Like in Narnia, Aslan is on the move. Anyone else? Something else you've seen. Thank you, Lorna, for sharing. Anyone else? This idea of we're... We're making people who can receive gifts. Somewhere you've seen it. You understand like, if you ever go back, if you guys all get bored and wanna go online and, and look at the, literally the aqueducts that the Roman empire developed. I mean, that's what made the Roman empire one of the things that they created the empire. They found a way to say it only rains in Italy in a few places. But what if we could bring rain to other places? then we wouldn't have pockets of agricultural development and then pockets of poverty. Just, I love this idea. I would have loved to see where it first started, where someone said, what if we could move the rain? So this is our call as a church. Think of the rain as the waters of baptism. We don't have to make the water, but we get to shape the font. And what if the font is more like a pipe and you find that there's an elementary school down the street um, and what they need, now, of course, what they need is Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. And for those of you who are like, oh, be careful, like I'm, I'm actually married to a Confucian who doesn't, everybody needs Jesus or he wouldn't have come. Okay, we can't be ashamed of saying that. 
Now, the problem is people have said that in the past with swords and guns and we've taken native people out of their communities and cut their hair and, and taught them the Lord's prayer and punished them for speaking um, Iroquois or Mayan. We've done horrible things, the Inquisition, the Crusades. I don't need to go through that with you. But just because we have sinned in how we've opened the jar does not change the call to open the jar. So we have to both acknowledge our sinfulness and not say we're no longer going to practice what Jesus did with the disciples when he said, drop your nets. Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. Woman at the well, come forward for water. Woman in the crowd, come forward for healing. So come follow me, taste and see. Remember then when they said Jesus, he were asking about his miracles and he said, follow me, follow me. So we have to keep following, even though we have been murderous, murderous, in different periods of history and how we've done that. But that does not, Satan Wood's greatest victory is if we say, you know what our problem is? We shouldn't be doing mission. It's oppressive, it's supremacy, it's mean. That would be such a victory for the devil, I can't even, I can't even articulate it. But to say we've done nothing wrong, to say that we have not sinned is, as the Bible says, we deceive ourselves. So we have to kind of be clear, like I love what you were just saying, Elizabeth, that, that it, it is in our burden. Um, we can aim the font. And even though people are afraid in a, in a multi-religious world, in a pluralist country, of being very clear about our Christianity and who Jesus is and that we think Jesus is for everybody. Um, and because of course he's for everybody. He stretched his arms out on the cross. He didn't like aim his body at people who were already following him. He is crucified with his arms outstretched so far they had to be nailed in place to show how wide the embrace of God is. So of course that includes your Jewish brother-in-law. Of course it does. Absolutely. But our challenge then is to figure out how do we aim the flooded water in our life at your Jewish brother-in-law. Maybe he needs jumper cables for his car. You know, my favorite thing to do is whenever someone asks me for jumper cables, should I mean they need a jump? My favorite thing to do is to give them the next day on their porch, a new set of jumper cables. I just leave it. I don't say, and a relationship with Jesus could go on for eternity. I don't, I frankly don't do that. That's not the kind of evangelism I believe is at the core of my Episcopal faith. I want them to come back to me and say, wait a minute, yesterday you gave me a jump. Today you gave me cables? I said, well, yeah, I heard you yesterday. You said you didn't have a set. So it sounds like you needed a set. So this isn't about money. I, there are other examples I could give. Do you know what I mean about giving someone soup? Or don't think that I'm saying that like Christianity is a consumer enterprise. I'm saying evangelism is about listening. That's the first line of my book. I don't know where my book is. I bet mom, mom, you bought all the copies. I don't have any here. But the first line of the book is evangelism is listening. Listening. Rowan Williams, at the opening of his book, you know what he says in, in Being Christian? He said, the Christian life is a listening life. Think about that. What a rebuke that is to the Inquisition and to the Crusades and to the extermination of Jews and the extermination of Native Americans. What makes that wrong is they were not listening. Christianity is a listening life and evangelism is hearing someone say, I don't have cables today because I don't have cables. And when I show up the next day and I hand them cables, even if I can't afford new ones and I give him mine, when I walk away, he says, she heard me. She heard me yesterday. In fact, I didn't even realize I was saying I don't have them. She heard me. Think of how many Psalms begin with David saying to God, I called and you heard my cry. So what does it mean to be an evangelist? Listen to people's cries and give everything in your basement, in your pocket, in your prayers, in your pantry, give it to them. And let them sit at home at night and say, I had no idea anyone was listening. And in COVID, write a card, send an email. I, I've, I looked at our um, street here and I've left a card at every, per I don't even talk to people in my street. I'm on one of these streets, such an Alexandria thing. There's no sidewalks. It's just big house, big house, big house, big house. We don't even know who we are. So I just started leaving cards to people in COVID. I hope you're well, 
let me know if you need anything. It's funny because we're like the poorest people on our street, <laughs> but I keep leaving notes here uh, up to the seminary and just say, let, let, let's, let us let us know. Because I bet when you're that wealthy, there aren't many people who ask you, do you need anything? But I want them to wake up and feel like someone is listening for my life. How is that possible? The, no the world is so noisy with that anxiety and politics and someone on my street is listening. And then, like the Bible says, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. So going back to um, uh, what Elizabeth was saying, like, it's a relief, right? I mean, we're not trying to like, you don't win a toaster if you get 10 people to come into your church, right? That kind of, that's exhausting. There are churches that work like that. It's amazing to me. I was in a church not long ago. You know, you get a better seat in the sanctuary if you've, how many people you've brought to Christ? Because they keep track. And if you're like 10 or 12 in a year, you, you actually sit up closer. Isn't that amazing? I'm like, that would drive me. We had a reformation over this kind of craziness. And by the way, Satan loves that. Satan loves that. He'll take the souls lost to hell just to see you sit in the front row saying how good you are at this. Our job is just to haunt people. I use that word, but I mean in a holy way. Like when someone opens up that card that says, if there's anything, and you know it's from the person who has the smallest house on your street and the oldest car on your street. But the card says, if there's anything that you need, please knock on my door. I'll give you anything that I have. That haunts people who, are, who think they're self-sufficient. They're like, who is this person? So as you start to think about yourselves and your church going forward into the new year, thank God, kiss goodbye 2020 in two weeks. The evangelism for you all to think about, I hope, if you want to do it as Episcopalians, is not to ask how many people you're going for. Remember, don't look, Rowan Williams says, we're listening. So Christian life, evangelism, it's all the same thing. Listening. How does your church, here's the question. How does your church listen better in 2021 than Russell Road Grace Church has ever listened before. It doesn't cost a dime. Any ideas? And by the way, it could be, here's something we're doing now that feels like listening. Does that make sense? Because I don't know a ton about your ministries. I, and funny, I lived in Warwick Village. Mom, do you remember the house in Warwick Village? Um, and I was on the back of Russell, my street was right up in Tennessee there. Like, so I looked down on Russell. So I've watched the back of your church for many years, cheering from you, cheering for you. Um, and I know, so I, I know those kinds of things, but help me now, where have you been listening? And if you had any idea of how you might, if you haven't thought of it before, let's make Satan, everybody spit at Satan right now. Drive him crazy. Start talking about how you've been listening and how you want to listen. I can already see the wipers are going to have to really wipe off the icon of the dark one. Bring it. Go ahead, everybody. Mom, watch these people. We've been watching this church for years. Let's see it. Just unmute yourself and dive in. The attitudes, if you wonder, uh, a lot of people are like, I'll talk to people and they'll say, okay, I'm ready to listen. What does that mean? And I'm like, well, if you want to tune your ear like a tuning fork, so you know what to listen for, the Beatitudes, that's like middle C. Um, I play the trumpet. And if any of you know anything about the trumpet, like it's hard to wind instruments. You have to sit next to someone who's got it. Or nowadays you can actually, you know, you can just, there's an app and you just type in, I want to hear a trumpet and you get a perfect that's a B flat actually. And then you, you tune it, right? So you know how that works so that you get that great note and then you're kind of off and you keep, you know, until you're tuned. So what's, what's the perfect C? How do you set your pitch as a Christian? And it's the Beatitudes. You could also use the baptismal covenant. I mean, look at the things we've promised to do, seek and serve Christ in all people, fight for justice, deep in the word, or the Beatitudes, blessed are the what. So think of that as your tuning. So read it and say to yourself, that's what I'm listening for, the hungry, the, mourn, the mourning, the persecuted. Um, so yes, amen to that, because what that means, remember, we're not in the business of giving food, right? We're not a food distributor. Satan loves that. How much food should we have? Do we have enough? Maybe we need better signage. That's the dark one saying to us, 
really it's about you. And you guys are pretty good at this. A spit on that. What happens when someone who was hungry has an engagement with Christ, with uh, Grace Church Russell Road and, and actually swallows something that they didn't have, they feel that we heard them. We heard their hunger. That's the evangelism where someone with, as they swallow say, I was heard, someone heard my cry. And we get to go to bed not saying we're so good at distributing food. We get to go to bed saying, I'm learning to hear what God hears. My ears are becoming God's ears. Mind, mind blown. Your ears becoming God's ears. That's why we haven't been zapped up. Because then we'd miss this unbelievable thing. So that's wonderful. Food pantry. I'll give you an example. Um, um, about, uh, so I was a chaplain at St. Stephen's St. Agnes School. You probably all know that place. And um, for many years, and here's my favorite. We used to make sandwiches for um, people to give out in, in DC for Martha's Table. Some of you probably know Martha's Table. So we'd make sandwiches. And the first year I started, we made 5,000 sandwiches that year because the administration wanted me to count the number of sandwiches. You know how this works, right? Because they wanted to publish that in a magazine. I'm not knocking them for it, but and then the next year, they're like, did you make more? I was like, actually, I counted up. We made like 10,000. So every year, can you picture what happened? The administration kept saying, we're publishing the magazine at the end of the year. How many sandwiches did you make, right? So after about 10 or 15 years, you know, Joan Holden, you know, she was the head of, if you know anything about the school, um, and she was a very dear friend of mine, and she was a visionary, right? And those of you who've been around long enough to know she was the first head when they merged the schools. Anyway, she came to me one year. We'd made 25,000 sandwiches that year. And she called me in and kind of wanted to give me a raise or something. And then she smiled. And this is why she's the head of a school. She said, how many years would it take us to make 50,000? And it was just this great conversation. And, and I kind of said like doubling. I mean, we've been at this for years and so we're only up to 25,000. And my head was starting to uh, get a bit of a headache. And then she said, okay, never mind." She said, how many sandwiches do you want to make next year? And that was a good leader. Like her whole thing is you tell me how many and then I'll as a leader I'll get you what you need. She said, and she just smiled with a twinkle. She said, how many sandwiches do you want to make next year? And I leaned forward and I said, zero. Because we're not in the business to make sandwiches. We're in the business to build a world where no one needs a sandwich from us. So I hope we make 50,000 to 50,000 people are hungry next year. But Joan, the goal is zero. <laughs> It's all in the book of Revelation. The goal is zero, that, 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 that the tears will be wiped away, that hunger will be gone, that loneliness will be shattered by community and the communion of saints will have such an embrace you'll wish you had a couple of minutes by yourself because you want to be able to handle that forever, forever. You will be in the community. Once again, you'll hug your grandchildren. You'll be hugged by your grandchildren. Even though that you lived a single life your whole life, you will have an experience of fullness of community that maybe you'd ever wanted in life. But when you actually experience it, for whatever reason, all that is coming. The goal is not to double the number of good deeds in the world. The, the goal is to mend the world in the, in the end of time. How many sandwiches did it next year? Zero. So I say that to you as a sort of challenge for your food pantry stuff. Like, Exactly what you just said. We want people to feel heard. But when we go and give them what we give them, we lean over and say, we are building a world where there will be no more hunger. Not because we had the right program, but because God will bring to completion the purpose of creation, which is to go back to the Beatitudes, that those who are mourning are no longer mourning. That those, And why are they not mourning? Because the, the death that they have experienced in their own life, their children, their spouses, their parents, that there will be a time where everything will be mended by the love of God and our bodies will be resurrected. So some of you are like, well, now she's getting crazy. I know I've got this thing with the prayer book. Our bodies will be resurrected. I've been, I've been ill. I've had lots of surgeries. I just had another surgery about a, two weeks ago. Um, and I now have, I can tell you this, I can tell by the crowd here, you probably, I have a, um, an ostomy bag now because I have a uh, uh, Crohn's disease. So th this has been a bit of a, um, uh, how do I say? Um, I don't know what the word is. Um, it's been a bit of a transition for me. <laughs> um, 
But I do find myself laying in bed at night and saying, I wonder if my glorified resurrected body will have a glorified ostomy bag or there'll be none at all. I'm not sure. Thomas Aquinas says that the incidentals of human life, like if you have a mole, will not be part of your resurrected body. So I wonder at night, I go to bed worrying about these things. Would Aquinas say that prosthetic devices are incidentales or will they be glorified? Which means I'll experience utter liberation. Not sure, but this is the Christian journey. I don't look at this and say my body's been broken. It's been altered. And in the end, God will do a new thing. You can't get away from glory. That's everybody's destiny. The question is, are we gonna fight it? Or are we gonna join it? Somebody else, I would love to hear another example. Something that your church is already doing. Two, um, go back to the gospel today. Um, God, every now and then when you talk like this, people, people come away and say, we don't need budgets. That's all Satan. You know, we just need to be like listening. And then I kind of laugh and think, this is why Christianity is complicated. Remember, C.S. Lewis was asked, why is Christianity so complicated? It can't be true. And Lewis said, life is complicated. So if Christianity were not complicated, it wouldn't be true. Right. So Christianity is complicated. But what we need to remember is there's a way that your food pantry or your thrift shop or whatever can serve listening. And there are ways that you wind up serving your food pantry. And then you're not listening, you're trying to not fail, or you're trying to make more sandwiches. So it's a, it's a, it, and that's why prayer is essential, um, that, that we have to surround all of our ministries with prayer, because um, it, is, it, is, um, it is childish. St. Paul says, put aside childish things. It's childish to not talk about budgets and scale, and actually good signage, you have to know how to get around. But the trick is that our ministries serve our passion to listen, not that we wind up serving our ministries. Again, Satan wins. You say, hey, show the, show the dark one a church that has 10 different ministries. And what screw tape does, or Satan, whatever you want to call him, smiles and says, okay, that's 10 opportunities to enslave those Christians, to make them feel guilty about not doing Sunday school and to then do Sunday school because it's their turn. Um, uh, or I'll do that drive for Meals on Wheels. I'm really busy today, but, ugh, you know, and Satan loves that because that's people becoming slaves to ministry. Remember, God doesn't need the ministry. Jesus could come back this afternoon and end this whole show. So God doesn't need us to do things. Um, but where we lose ourselves and lose our, like Jason, where we lose our joy is when ministries that began with a good idea and scared the daylights out of the devil we then allowed our congregations financially and ours to become slaves to them. And they become a burden and guilty. Have you taken your shift? The silent auction's coming. I haven't done that for a couple of years. I'm, I probably should, I don't wanna say no. You know, this whole thing we get into where Satan is giggling at us, that we've become a slave. St. Paul said, it is, it is for freedom that you've been set free. So our ministry should feel like freedom. That doesn't mean it's not stressful. I bet everyone on this call has stayed up late one night doing something involved with the ministry at church because you're a little behind and you're ironing, you're taking the wine out of the corporal or you're having to go set up for the St. Patrick's thing or you're blessing animals and where's the water? You're good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being busy. Jesus loves Mary and Martha, but he does say between Mary and Martha, Mary's having a lot more joy than Martha. He's not saying, I don't want to eat. Stop doing that. What he's saying is, Martha, are you enjoying this night? You've become a slave to hospitality. You've become a slave to hospitality. And therefore you're missing community and fellowship and feasting. So that's not a story that says, stop cleaning the kitchen in your parish hall. What it's saying is, and don't you all know someone who like that whole potluck dinner, they never came out of the kitchen. They just, they were making sure that all the lids got matched to the Tupperware. They're worried about the mice. And they've gone home and literally been a slave to the potluck dinner and Satan is laughing. On the other hand, don't we all know someone who shows up to the potluck dinner and eats all the brownies and goes home as if someone else is just gonna clean up, right? So something in the middle, but like we can't be a slave to our ministries because then we're not listening anymore. Uh, we're listening to the to-do list and not to the Holy Spirit who's giggling and laughing and dancing and loving and singing. I'll say this one, one thing for you to think about going forward. Um, the, uh, you know, we talk about parish bounds. 
Jason, when you became, when you started working, were you ever shown a picture of the parish bounds of that parish? I'm just curious. And in the Episcopal tradition or the Anglican tradition, we believe in, in that you take um, a, a country and you carve it up by parish or by diocese, right? But here's the thing, remember, this is very unique to us. If you are a Congregationalist or a Presbyterian, you believe in what's called, um, uh, it, it's called a gathered church model. And, and by the way, Lutherans, don't worry, Father, Lutherans are getting this right. Um, but Congregationalists and Presbyterians, they believe you build a church and you gather people to it. Does that make sense? Across the world, it's a gathered church model. That's not our model. We believe in the parish model, which is to say a zip code or 10 streets or 30, is we are responsible for that parish. And the reason you build a church is that that's the central point where you organize how you're going to love the parish. So the church doesn't suck people in as a gathered church, like congregationalism, you gather people into the congregation. By the way, I'm not insulting our brothers and sisters. I'm just saying it's, we have a very different ecclesiology. We believe God has carved out the whole world into areas small enough to be taken responsibility for by a certain group of people. And we carve it, we carve it a diocese to organize parishes and the parish bounds are, you know, 10 blocks this way or four miles that way. And what that means is we are responsible for the joy and salvation, which go together, of that parish, period. It has nothing to do with whether or not they join our church. Russell Road, like over in Arlandria, if there are undocumented people who need to learn English who are trying very desperately because they don't have a living wage, that's your parish. And in our ecclesiology, we don't gather people among them and like a magnet and draw them in to become members of Grace Episcopal Church. I mean, that would be great too. And if we do everything right, they probably will. We have moral responsibility for our parishes. That's why there aren't like easements in between parishes. Like England, the entire country, by the way, you, you could just draw the lines of the parishes. That's a theological statement. That's not geography. And the idea is Christ died for all. Christ has eternal life for all. So I love our model, but if you ever wonder going forward as a parish, what, what, what kind of ministry should we do? Where do we listen? Begin with, okay, where is the area? And then St. Clement, where I serve, right? We're, right? we're right along one of your sides. So maybe sometimes we'll do stuff together because the community we're helping maybe goes over the line. That's fine. We don't want to get fundamentalist about the lines. But unlike other, unlike Presbyterian churches, we, we don't have to wake up in the morning and say, God, where have you called us? In this denomination, it doesn't mean we're not called to do missions in Africa and Australia and everything else, but our primary calling, you already have the place where we are told be, this, you've been, I don't know why, but you've given this to us. And that's where we're going to listen. We're going to listen right here, not Old Town, because I hope, I hope there's a couple of Episcopal churches who are listening over there. But if we all do our job, then the country has the ears of God. So keep that in mind too, in your mind, when you just kind of feel like, you know, we're, how do we do in, in 2021 and our new advent comes, we have a new year. How do we think about our new year? Think about, we don't have to decide where we're going to listen. Our ecclesiology has given us a parish and it is a beautiful thing to leave a note on someone's door and say, this is, this area is the parish of grace, which means we take responsibility. If there's anything that you need, call us. We may not have it. But it is our responsibility to hear you say what your needs are. And we will do everything we can to maybe connect you with someone who can. But God has called us to listen right here. And we just want you to know we are listening. Parish name on it. Just so, again, not to get credit or to get members, but just make it very clear that we believe to listen. And someone else might just pick it up and be like, well, I don't really care. Other people might just be haunted by it. Like, these people just wanted me to know they're listening to my needs. Really? Like what, what's, what's in it for them and have them see, no, this is our, this is what it means to be a Christian in, in our parish. That's all. We're just listening. Beautiful because you know what, they didn't fix your problem and you didn't actually ask them to do that, but look at the ways, like someone just opened your jar. Cause when someone just showers you with gifts, you just, you find yourself having to put it somewhere. So it kind of forces people to just take it, take in a gift. And you know what? The next morning, God can give them more. God can give them more. 
once someone realizes it's actually nice to receive a gift, um, then all of a sudden the sunrise the next morning actually has more colors in it than they've noticed in a month. And thank you for saying it, because, you know, in upper middle class communities, which a lot of us live in, even if you're not that way, that's where we live. We do start to say, you ever say this, like, I don't know what to give my friend. Nobody needs anything. Do you know what I mean? So it's really hard in the Catholic tradition. I was raised what's called the corporal acts of mercy. <laughs> um, and the corporal acts of mercy are just um, um, uh, a list of, of basically the Beatitudes, things to do, you know, visit those in prison, visit the sick, feed the hungry water to the thirsty. And I was raised that in, in the Catholic moral tradition that that's, you you know, you wanna do corporal acts of mercy. Um, but again, if we start thinking about that, we forget the joy in it, uh, which is that we all long to have corporal acts of mercy shown to us. And then you can't help, Rowan Williams is right. That forms you into the kind of person who can receive the gift God wants to give you tomorrow so I give you a gift today so that some incredible gift that God gives tomorrow, you will notice. Your jar is open because I aimed my aqueduct at you and the water that could never come from me, but, but flows through me, got you soaking wet. And then I walked away, left you wet with God's love. And you're like, that was awesome. And then you look for it in, in new places that I, the person who ran the food pantry, could never imagine you'd find it tomorrow. But you found it tomorrow because we got into you today. I want to stop though, because this is it. what's going to happen is we're going to like miss Advent if we just keep talking. Let's end on this. Yay. Hung hunger will end. Mourning and weeping will end. Hunger, thirst, war, division, all of it. One of the worst problems in Christian theology is this weird medieval idea that we will go to heaven by leaving the earth, that we will be beamed up. That is wrong. I don't know what Bible that came from. We pray in the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven. It's coming here. Everything broken you see here will be healed. Creation is not just going to be recycled at the end of time. So look around this broken, angry, distressful world in some ways and just get excited. This will end. The only question is how involved we want to be. But the destiny is certain. The question is, do you want to join? So thank you, everybody.